Hello, everyone, and welcome to Food Tanks webinar series. This is Sarah Small. I'm Food Tanks Global Events Director. I'm really excited about today's webinar with Clara Coleman. She's a second generation organic farmer, consultant, writer, and keynote speaker. Clara is also the daughter of renowned farming pioneer Elliot Coleman. Today, she'll be presenting and telling the story of four season farming. This webinar will be recorded and posted on foodtank.com afterwards, and you can follow along and participate on Twitter using hashtag foodtank. Please also submit your questions using the uh, chat box in your control panel or email them to me, sarah at foodtank.com. So without further ado, Clara, it's wonderful to have you here today, and I'm excited to hear your presentation. I will give you the floor now. Thank you, Sarah. It's a, an honor to be here and to be a part of this uh, wonderful food tank community. You guys are doing great work. So let's begin. Um, when I was a child over 30 years ago, organic and local definitely were not trendy and sustainable agriculture was certainly part of the fringe movement at that time and definitely no one had heard of four season farming. Uh, most farmers did not even think it to be possible. They would typically laugh or scoff at the idea or envision some warmer location like Florida or California. But here in the northern climates, no, that, that seemed impossible. Um, this picture, this next picture here of beautiful beds of cold hardy greens in a greenhouse would have been considered an, an anomaly, a, a fantasy even. All the snow piling up on the greenhouse and fresh beautiful greens to be harvested inside. But I remember the exact moment when this crazy idea of four season farming went from being a, a crazy idea to a fledgling reality. So picture a, a cold, dark January day. Imagine a raging storm outside, blowing snow and brown trees for as far as the eye can see. My brother and I were inside the house preparing for dinner, and suddenly the door slams open, and there stands my father covered head to foot in snow and clutching something to his chest. He had this sort of wicked gleam in his eye. He you know, had a huge smile on his face, and he looked as if he had just discovered gold or learned to walk on water. Guys, he said, look what I just found in the cold frame. And in one hand, he revealed this red and white orb of, of radicchio, and the other hand, this bunch of gleaming orange carrots with green tops. Now, despite our excitement for fresh food in January, the radicchio did not end up being a very big hit. It is in the bitter-tasting um, chicory family, not very pleasing to young palates. So whenever it would appear on the dinner table from there on, my brother and I would roll our eyes and say, oh no, we're not eating the ridiculous again. But those carrots, they were an entirely different story. One bite of that sweet, crisp candy carrot, and I was a believer. Yes, vegetables really can be grown in winter. Four season farming really is possible. So not only did this momentous discovery propel my father to develop the methods and techniques for successful four season farming found today in the Northeast, it has also influenced a whole new generation of farmers to test the supposed limits of what is possible in farming. Now, although it took me a number of years and quite a few detours in between to become a farmer, it's also that moment that inspired me to start my own farm in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. So in 2008, I started Divide Creek Farm. It comprised of total 200 acres uh, at 6,200 feet in elevation. And I did basically mimicked uh, what my domain, and it was about an acre and a half of mi mixed vegetables, uh, intensively cultivated year-round, using movable greenhouses, uh, going to year-round farmers markets, um, and we even had a herd of, of black uh, Angus uh, cattle as well. So this was it was definitely a success, and it also inspired me to want to give back to farmers and to share this information with with more people. I was surprised at how few people um, were even, you know, doing this in Colorado. Um, so I started my consulting business, Clara Coleman Four Season Farm Consulting, as a way to, to get this information out to more people. Um, and with a move back to Maine as well, I've been able to collaborate more with my father and uh, do projects together. 
So what makes Four Season Farming so unique? What are its secrets? And with all of its obvious challenges, why should this next generation take up this work and expand it into the 21st century? Well, what makes Four Season Farming so unique is really its simplicity. It's taking this simple concept of protecting cold hardy crops from the harsh elements in order to uh, continuously harvest them through the winter. Uh, so it's not so much the cold that affects and kills the plant life, but it's the desiccating effects of the wind and the blowing snow. So that leads us into secret number one, cold hardy crop selection. Most of the crops here we're, we're talking about are not, not heat loving energy intensive crops like tomatoes and cucumbers, but these cold hardy crops, um, most of your greens, spinach, kale, um, lettuces, arugula, Asian greens, even onions, leeks, radishes, and of course those famous candy carrots. All of these crops actually prefer to grow in cooler climates and their flavor improves as well. The second secret is light, latitude, location, and timing. So not only is um, crop selection, or sorry, not only are uh, plants affected by uh, the cold, but they're dependent on the daylight hours, um, which is determined by our latitude. So active growth is significantly reduced during the winter months when the days have less than 10 hours of daylight per day. This is also known as the Persephone period. This is a name that um, my dad came up with, which is a reference to Greek mythology and the story of Persephone, who was married to Hades, the god of the underworld. And when she had to spend the winter um, in the underworld with Hades, her mother Demeter, the god of, of the harvest, in protest, would prevent all plant life from flourishing. So here in Maine, where I am in Portland, Maine, at the 43rd parallel, this Persephone period takes place usually from the first week of November until the first week of February. So it's incredibly important that the timing of plantings take place early enough in the fall in order to have enough growth before you get uh, below 10 hours per day. The third secret is protection from the elements. And this all can take the form of various type of high tunnel structures, um, greenhouses, hoop houses, low tunnels, cathedral tunnels, uh, any different uh, form of, of a structure that's protecting the plant. The main point here is that each layer of protection basically brings your USDA hardiness zone one and one and a half zones further to the south. Two layers would bring you three zones. So for instance, if here we are in Maine outside here and just inside the greenhouse, this would bring us down to a New Jersey winter. And then underneath this low tunnel here where the crop is, another one and one half zones would bring us down to Georgia. So this would be winter in Georgia down here. So as you can see, those two layers of protection without any supplemental heating can make a huge improvement on the conditions of the plants. The fourth secret is effective use of specialized tools and appropriate technology. Obviously, most of these farms are small scale and not doing a lot of acreage. Most of the technology has been focused on industrial agriculture, large scale machinery. So we really need to develop um, you know, efficient and effective tools that can be used to help these farmers do their job better. But before we get into more of the details of that secret, you might be even asking yourself, uh, four season farming, why bother? I mean, look at all that snow that can build up on a greenhouse and all the work that farmers have. And especially after an incredibly long and arduous summer, don't you want to take a break? Um, well, that may be true, but I believe there are many more opportunities and benefits uh, of growing year round uh, than disadvantages. Um, the first being just the simple joy and satisfaction of growing your own delicious local produce year round. Um, both my father and I grew artichokes. Uh, I did it in Colorado. He does it here in Maine. And he likes to joke, the, the joke in the family is that we grow artichokes just to make the Californians nervous. So, you know, the more that can be grown around here, definitely more satisfaction. Um, it makes it much more food security locally as well. 
Uh, the, the next advantage is during the winter, there are very few issues with weeds, pests, and diseases. Uh, and minimal irrigation is necessary as well because the water table raises in the winter. So most of those challenges that farmers may experience in the summer uh, are very few in the winter, so it makes it a lot easier. And then expanded sales opportunities, really important point. Um, these days, a lot of farmers are experiencing sort of saturation in the marketplace in, in local markets in the summer. Uh, CSA sales seem to be, you know, haven't been increasing as dramatically as they used to be. Um, winter or summer farmers markets seem to be plateauing as well. But there's all this opportunity in the winter. You have winter farmers markets, winter CSAs, and everyone, you know, really appreciates that fresh local produce, especially in the winter. Um, and would prefer to buy it locally if they can. Year-round employment. If you're farming year-round and have a consistent income, you can afford to keep on um, you know, those employees year-round. And that's especially important because most uh, seasonal farmers have to lay off their workers. Um, they can lose really good workers uh, by having to lay them off. Um, so again, it supports the local economy to, to have employees year-round. And then this is always kind of a question, you know, could you potentially structure your year where you could have your summers off? What a concept. Um, you have more time of it and be able to enjoy summer eventually. A little bit without necessarily selling summer, but growing winter crops, the storage crops during the summer, which then he would sell during the winter farmer's market. So that way he has time to um, organize this Winter Growers Conference, for instance, this was took place last year. It was called Frozen Ground, and it was a collection of about 30 experienced winter growers. And we um, got together for a couple days to really try to come up with the standards of winter growing so that we could share it with more farmers. Um, and finally, most importantly, I believe that four season farming equals local and sustainable agriculture. It, it's just imperative that we are able to produce, um, if we can, in the areas that we live in. So if we have very you know, simple techniques that are not energy intensive, it really, to me, makes good sense. So back to that first secret number one, what are the, the typical one of crops that you can see? Um, those famous candy carrots, for instance. Now these are fresh carrots, not storage. Uh, the trick with them is because they're freshly harvested and in the cold ground in the winter, their starches convert to sugar and they become exceptionally sweet and candy-like. Candy -like. So that's what makes them so special. Spinach. It's known as really the best winter producer. Uh, it, the flavor gets sweeter. It, it prefers to grow in the winter. And anytime the ambient air temperature is above 40 degrees, it will continuously regrow. So it's a great winter producer. And then there's the ever popular kale, sweet and tender and um, incredibly popular. Arugula, very mild in flavor during the winter. It's, uh, it's not as spicy and hot as it is in the summer. All those lettuces, head lettuces, baby leaf, plenty of great salad mixes there. Uh, Swiss chard, the, uh, the color of their stalks actually gets much more vibrant from the cold conditions, so it's incredibly colorful. Mosh, this is a, also known as corn salad. It's really the cold, hardiest of all the greens. Makes a really great salad, um, very delicate green. Leeks, now with leeks, they're actually planted in the spring, but then they're protected in the fall with one of the, the high tunnel structures, and then they can be harvested all winter long, so you have freshly harvested leeks all winter long. Uh, radishes, Incredibly beautiful, crunchy, sweet, and so nice that color in the middle of the winter. And then the other crops, you know, a whole handful of different Asian greens, beet greens, uh, turnips, onions, some herbs like parsley and cilantro, really is just of, of different crops. So now to that second secret again. I'm not going to get to too many of the details here because it can get fairly complex, but the timing and the frequency of those succession plantings is really critical to the success of, of any four season growing calendar. And what I want to show you here is, uh, depending on the type of protection you're using, this chart here shows you the extended season of availability for crops. So what I have outlined here is 
most of the crops I just showed you in the previous slides. Uh, so all these cold hardy crops. And this shows you the months of the year that they would be available based on this system. So if you, you know, there's really only um, one crop there, carrots, that needs any kind of heated, normal heated greenhouse, and that's March and April. But everything else is very minimally, um, or even storage, for instance. So every month of the year, you pretty much can have these crops available locally. Okay, and then on to the third secret here, the protection from the winter elements. Um, and all these, these greenhouses, high tunnels, there's many different names that are being tossed around, but really what I'm referring to is as a plastic or glass structure that's over the soil. And what's important again to, the he to reiterate here is that you know, within this unheated high tunnel, you, that two layers of protection is super important. Um, early on, uh, Elliot used to experiment more with just the cold frame. So, you know, any home gardener could have a cold frame outside. Uh, it, it is aesthetic, um, definitely a nice can, small area to be able to protect things and extend your season. But early on, he used to experiment with putting them into the, the high tunnel. Uh, and this gave you essentially that two layers of protection. You know, while this seemed smart, ultimately it, it was much more expensive, didn't use the space very efficiently, and hard to, to ventilate. So that's what moves on to these low tunnels here, which are just using the re, this remake cloth and then these simple hoop structure, you know, hoops that go over the beds and are held down by with sandbags. So these can be used um, on their own individually throughout the winter. They can be used. Uh, you can over overwinter crops like onions and spinach in here. Uh, so, for instance, here's an example of what it would look like inside with spinach. Um, I always used to joke that I would send my kids in here to harvest the spinach in the winter because they're only ones small enough to get in there. But w actually, an adult can fit, and here he is looking pretty happy doing it. So um, it is possible to just use a very simple structure to protect spinach. But the advantage here really is if you can put them inside the greenhouse, you have so much more space um, and much easier for uh, anyone to harvest inside. Definitely more comfortable. Um, and then I'm going to touch just briefly on movable greenhouses or high tunnels. Um, Elliot always likes to say that there really is nothing new in agriculture. It's just these old ideas that keep being rediscovered by every couple of generations and um, you know adopted and made appropriate with the technology of the of the day. So movable greenhouses are actually not a new idea. The first commercial movable greenhouse was built in 1898 in England using train tracks. Um, today there are a couple of commercial manufacturers of models today. They, they use either these rails um, or some sort of V-track system to move it or even pneumatic tires, for instance. Um, but then, you know, you might ask, well, why movable? What, what, what would be the point of, of moving a greenhouse? Well, for this four-season farming system, it's really important that you're efficiently using the space. Um, if in the summer you're growing a crop like cucumbers here, and you need to plant your winter crop um, in August when the cucumbers are still producing, you don't want to have to rip this crop out to get the carrots in the ground. So this way, you, you plant them out front, it's still producing cucumbers, and then once these are done, then you can move the greenhouse over the carrots to protect them for the winter. So that, that's where it really is important. Um, so before the move, the greenhouse would be here. Here would be the tunnels outside. After the move, the low tunnels are inside the tunnel. The old crop is outside. So really, as a quick review, the advantages are allows for easier transition from fall to winter crops. Better soil health, this is a big one here. It reduces the buildup of pests and diseases and excess nutrients in the soil, which is common in um, stationary greenhouses and tunnels. And even soil solarization for weed management. You can use that um, you know, plastic uh, structure over the, over the soil to kill all the weed seeds. And then, you know, for home gardeners or someone who do, does not want to do it on that commercial level, the really inexpensive build-it-yourself option, this is the cathedral tunnels that Elliot designed as well. All these parts are sourced from the fencing department of hardware stores. Um, easily, you can build a, a frame in about a day. There are four people who can pick them up, um, one, one module, and carry it anywhere to place it over a crop. Uh, here's a, a 
picture of the four people placing it over beds of spinach in late fall. And here are the beautiful beds of spinach inside, and this is what it looks like. So they're perfectly suitable for winter use and definitely an inexpensive way to, um, to be able to protect and extend the season. So back to the fourth secret, the specialized tools of four season farming. Um, obviously, Elliot, he's been developing tools for the last 45 years, uh, constantly tinkering and, and trying to, to make innovative tools. So, but just more recently, about four years ago, we started the Slow Tools Group, sort of a paying homage to the slow food movement, um, trying to, to come up with a group of farmers, engineers, and makers who can, uh, you know, innovate and quickly produce tools that farmers can use. Um, so one of the, the early um, prototypes was this electric tractor, uh, trying to develop something inexpensive and would be appropriate for the scale, the small scale of a, of a smaller farm um, and uh, could basically replace all the manual labor that is, is typically being done on farms. So here's a prototype of one. This was displayed at the Young Farmers Conference at, uh, in Stone Barns in New York a couple of years ago. Um, and then here is uh, the quick, this is one of the best success stories, the quick cut greens harvester. This was developed by this kid, Jonathan Dysinger. And it, it really was, you know, helping the, the harvesting of these greens, which was so labor intensive. And I actually have a quick little three minute video to, to play for you to kind of gives you the background of it and um, just see how it works. So here it goes. <laughs> This is really the thing that makes small farm mesclin all of a sudden a paying proposition for a small farmer. It really revolutionized growing. Growing up on a farm, I spent hours on my hands and knees. So I was very aware of the need for a mechanical greens harvester. So my inventive mind spent a lot of time thinking about ways to improve greens harvesting. But it wasn't until at age 16, in the fall of 2009, my father and I had the opportunity to go visit Elliot Coleman's farm, and he brought up the greens harvester and really encouraged me to take it and run with it and try and develop a greens harvester that would help to alleviate labor with greens production on small farms. I came back from Elliot's farm energized about developing a greens harvester. And we started making prototypes using modified hedge trimmers and quickly had, had prototypes that were working and we were using on our farm, but they were very rough. But it wasn't until a couple of years later we helped an engineer friend that we came up with a design that worked better than I could have imagined. And in the fall of 2012, we started production and it went on the market. Up until now, there's been no mechanical harvester in between scissors and knife and $10,000 units. When we got it, it was a major breakthrough because it used to take us three people two hours to do the harvest of our salad and uh, greens in the morning. And when we got the harvester, it just, I would do the same job in 40 minutes with a 200% improvement on the labor time. It's the kind of appropriate technology that we need for small scale micro farming. Anybody who's ever cut mesclun by hand is going to love this gadget. Look at the ease with which it goes. And not only that, when you have a taller crop like this, which we all end up with at some point, you can cut it at any height you want, even though you're mechanized the whole time you're doing it. One person with this can replace three or four hand cutters very, very easily. It will give a cleaner cut than a knife or scissors. It's just an incredible tool in the tool chest of a small farm. It truly has put baby greens back in the list of profitable crops for a small farm. It's going to put us back in the baby leaf salad business. Okay, great. So as you can see, that. 
it's a really uh, useful and impressive tool for, for small farmers to use. And you might have noticed that it had that um, electric, or sorry, battery power drill um, operating it. Um, so this, here's another tool that Elliot developed called the Tilther for bed preparation. And it uses the same uh, DeWalt, you know, or Makita power drill to operate it. And, you know, why not utilize what is already in a, an effective tool to, to create something else? Um, and then another one recently is, is this electric tiller called the Tilly. And this is pretty ingenious because it's a battery powered 24 volt electric hub motor. So th these are the hub motors you know you, you would see in the motorcycle industry, for instance. Um, but being able to appropriate them for farming tools is a huge advantage. And of course, I, I couldn't not mention um, Elliot's veggie wagon here. Um, he built this on a, on a little trailer, uh, completely self-contained farm cart. Uh, everything fits inside for transport, uh, and then you set it up at the farmer's market or a roadside. Everything's all there and ready to go for sales. So he's very proud of this uh, veggie wagon. <clears throat> so we come back to that, that carrot and sort of the question of why does four season farming really matter? Well, for me, the, the obvious answer is my children. This is my son Hayden eating a carrot. Um, and, you know, it matters for the next generation. Just like I experienced as a child that moment of magic eating my first candy carrot, I want to inspire the next generation that if vegetables can really be grown in the winter, then anything is possible in farming. And we really can bring four season farming forward into the 21st century. And perhaps one day, everyone will believe that farmers really can walk on water. So questions? More info can be on Facebook, um, Twitter, and my website. So back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Clara. That was wonderful. I know I learned a lot, and it was a really informative presentation. Uh, we do have a lot of questions to go through from listeners, uh, and also a reminder to our listeners to continue to send them in if you have them using that chat box or emailing them to me, sarah at foodtank.com. Uh, but for the next 15 minutes or so, let's get through as many as possible. So I'd like to start by asking you, Clara, uh, a first question from a listener. How do you expect four season farming to look or, or change uh, 10 years from now? And how do you expect contemporary issues such as climate change to affect four season farming? And do these issues necessitate any fundamentally different strategies as those employed by the sustainable farmers of the 70s and 80s? Um, great, um, question. great question. So I guess so, I'll um, – actually, Sarah, there's a feedback. Do you hear that? Okay. I'll address the climate change. Um, obviously, it's a big issue. The one benefit, I would say, of climate change is that it's making – northern climates uh, more mild in winter, so uh, not necessarily as challenging to produce these crops. Um, so I, I tend to like to look at the positive side of, of negative things. Uh, so I see that as an, a potential advantage. Uh, in terms of where it's going to go 10 years from now, um, I am, you know, we're, I, one of the challenges is that it's, it's so many of these small farms are are trying are getting such a small piece of the pie here, and and how do we scale up this? This um, one of the projects that I'm working on is is looking at producing sort of a a four season co farming project where it produces these sort of um, blocks of farmers managing their their 12 acres of land, um, and they would all be able to have co managed sales and distribution and storage. Um, within sort of a, a large chunk of land that would be near popular areas um, or populated areas, urban areas. So, so again, just really trying to think outside the box of how can we scale this up, but also still maintain the integrity of the you know this model that Elliot has worked on for the last 45 years. And I, I see that is getting lost in a lot of the traditional scaling up of organic agriculture. Thanks, Clara. Uh, and the next question is, what are some of the biggest challenges in switching to four season farming, and how do you help young people and beginning farmers to overcome some of these obstacles? Yeah, so usually it, what I typically say is that it's just the learning curve can be a little steep initially. 
Um, if you're starting out, I think it's really important to, to anticipate trying to structure your business model, including four season farming, because if you're already going to have high tunnels, for instance, maybe you'd consider getting a movable model as opposed to a stationary model, or you'd just really be anticipating you know, all these slight nuances of, of how to do it year round. Um, you know, there are obviously plenty of books. Elliot has written three books that have information. Um, those are definitely the Bibles out there for courses and growing. Um, farming conferences seem to be bringing more of that information to their conferences. Uh, again, I mean, the fact that we were able to organize a, a frozen ground growing conference, um, that's a huge step that we're really trying to put more energy into making this easier for farmers to learn about and do. Um, but so much of it is just trial and error. I mean, that's really how Elliot learned all this. I mean, he was just constantly tinkering, experimenting, and figuring it out. And most of it is just about that experience level. Um, so that that's really what it is, just testing it out. Thanks again. And uh, two more technical questions from listeners. Uh, one of our listeners asks, what about a movable tunnel in a high wind place? Um, is, that, is that still possible? And then also, is there any suggestions you have for people who are just starting out on which crops to, to try first? Uh, yep. So the... Everyone always worries about <laughs> uh, uh, greenhouses blowing away, and that's that's a valid concern. Uh, I didn't actually show some photos uh, with some of the movable models. We are using 4,000 um, pound uh, ground anchors with chain binders, so basically anchoring them down into the ground. And Elliot has never had any major issues with you know anything blowing away. It really is just about common sense. Um, of how to anchor them properly. So, so that's, it's a concern for sure, but I think as long as you're using forethought on how to anchor them, uh, you shouldn't have a problem. And then in regards to the crops to start off with, I believe was the question, um, you know, anything that doesn't necessarily require uh, supplemental heating. So I think I mentioned the spinach and kale, um, you know, the, the carrots, um, all those Asian greens, all the things that really can take the cold, you know, the fluctuations of the cold uh, seem to, to do really well and you're not as sort of worried about is it going to make it. So I think, you know, falling back on those kind of um, foolproof crops would be important. Thanks, Clara. And you talked in your presentation a little bit about um, the, the benefits of, of four-season farming, but this question is more related to youth. So how does four season farming make the agriculture field more appealing to youth and how impactful are the financial gains of farming year round versus in the spring and summer, um, typical growing seasons? Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, why this might make farming more uh, engaging for youth? Okay. Okay. You said youth. Is that right? Did I hear you say? Young, I hear you say young people. For young people. Yes. For young people. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I think as I was trying to point out in the beginning, you know, and at the end, that it made the biggest impact to me as a child. So having the exposure that, you know, wow, you can actually harvest a carrot in the winter time. I mean, that makes such an impact on kids. So again, the education component is huge. Um, how to get more kids out to farms that are actually practicing, you know, these techniques, uh, exposing them, you know, obviously all that is important. And uh, I guess next question was reference to financial improvements or gains. Um, so I guess what I, I, I didn't get into that too much during the talk because it can kind of get more complicated. But what I like to point out is that, you know, the average gross sales per acre for sort of a small diversified farm, and this isn't necessarily a year-round farm, is usually 20000 to $30,000, uh, you know, dollars an acre. Um, so, and you know, and then hired labor, labor is typically uh, 25 to 35 percent of the gross sales. So, you know, for a five-acre farm, a, a farmer might net 30,000. Um, but the four-season farming model uh, with an acre and a half, uh, Elliot in particular, I mean, he grosses around 150,000 for that acre and a half, and so does Jean Martin Fortier. Um, in Quebec, I mean, he's been on this huge tour promoting his um, 
you know, how much money he's able to make on such a small acreage. Um, and he says that he has operating margins of 60%. So, so that, it goes to show that, you know, that this model is definitely much more profitable than, you know, most standard forms of farming. And again, it's just really about how to maximize your space and have efficient techniques to be able to, to do it in this manner. Thanks, Clara. Uh, and the next question reads, I think many people don't realize that you can have fresh carrots in the middle of winter. Uh, so in what ways through your consulting company, and you mentioned um, the, the Frozen Ground Conference of uh, farmers coming together, how are, are things like this and others spreading the knowledge, or how can our participants that are listening today spread that understanding? Yeah, yeah. Question. Um, you know, I think what I find is helpful is, um, engaging with farmers, whether it's at a farmer's market, CSA, you know, inquiring with them, are they, you know, considering four season farming? Um, it, it's just really about getting that conversation going, especially even with where, you know, if you don't have a CSA and you buy your groceries um, at a grocery store or a local market, I mean, engaging with them, um, you know, the produce buyers, for instance, so they understand that it is possible that there are farmers who are doing it. Um, again, it's more about building the buzz, the understanding, um, and you know, just just supporting anyone who is doing it. I think that's especially important, uh, making sure that that they are being appreciated for making the effort to do this. Great. Uh, and our next question is a lot about the the technology that you talked about. So, are there companies currently developing four season farming technology? Um, that you know your t slow tools group. Uh, I know another one, Farm Hack, um, in the, you know the video about the greens harvester. So, are there other outlets or forums for people to to buy these type of small scale lower tech solutions? Or are there any um, companies that are starting to develop this new technology that's more appropriate for small scale farming? Yes. Good question. Um, so, Johnny's Selected Seeds, uh, they're a seed company here in Maine, but they have an incredible uh, tool department, and they have been carrying most of the tools that Elliot has developed. So that's the best source um, for a lot of the, the tools I, I illustrated. Um, but there's also, you know, the, the Slow Tools group, which is just really it, you know, it has not quite been incorporated as a nonprofit yet, but hopefully it will. Um, Farm Hack does a lot of work as well, it, it getting farmers together to figure out, you know, how to how to solve problems on certain things and innovate new tools. Um, but what actually Elliot has done this summer is he hired two engineering students from our local university, University of Maine here, and ha has employed them on his farm to basically uh, be the engineering minds for all the ideas that he comes up with on the farm. So again, like matching those engineers with the farmers, I mean, that there's so much room for growth in that model of, of how do we get you know, all these mines working together. Um, the, the markets, the outlets for selling these tools, there's not a lot of you know, money to be made. So Johnny is, is devoted to doing it, but there needs to be more, uh, more of these companies uh, dedicated to selling these tools and, and innovating them as well. Um, in terms of the greenhouses, the Rimmel greenhouses and four season tools. They're, you know, definitely very innovative in doing the movable tunnels. And then that cathedral tunnel that I showed you, that the do-it-yourself model, the plans for that are actually found on, on Johnny's uh, Selected Seeds website. So that's something where you can download the manual. Um, you would just have to purchase a hoop bender from them, and then all the other parts and supplies you would purchase elsewhere. So um, plenty of of options out there, but I more and more people need to get involved and, and, uh, and you know that these be made available. Thanks, Clara. Uh, and it sounds like your father really influenced you as a farmer, uh, maybe not immediately to get into farming, but it's, it's part of what has shaped and form you, formed you as a farmer today. Uh, can you talk about any sort of mentor programs or, or other types of uh, mentorship um, opportunities for younger farmers to get into that might be interested in sustainable agriculture? Yeah, good question. Um, I always like to joke that I learned farming through osmosis, <laughs> and most people don't have that advantage. Um, 
So, uh, yes, there are tremendous opportunities out there. I mean, this whole new movement of, of young farmers is exploded recently. Um, you have, you know, all of your uh, mafkas, you know, Maine Organic Farming Association, all of those have usually some sort of mentorship program. The main one has a journey person program. Um, there are some, you know, farm schools out there, um, but really, you know, the, you know, there definitely there are universities that have programs as well in sustainable agriculture, and all that is great. But both Elliot and I are firm believers that this is the type of um, skill uh, and knowledge that you need to do it to learn it. So interning on farms, finding good farms to, you know, to intern, apprentice on, be employed on, um, you know, get that experience. I think, you know, it's really critical in all of this. Um, Elliot still takes, you know, uh, you know, up to eight interns each year. So, you know, there's an opportunity to work on his farm. Um, but any of that experience is really critical in, um, in developing your skill as a farmer. Thanks, Clara. And just one more question, uh, to, and actually to, to run off of your answer just now, is are there any other resources that uh, young people or people of any age can look to to start their own organic four season farms? Um, where might they find these? And more specifically, are there financial resources for people to get started? Um, yeah, so, you know, the Currently, the, the biggest barriers to, to entry um, as a young farmer are land and capital, uh, which obviously are two huge issues. Um, the cost of land, uh, finding good, suitable farming land, um, and having the capital to, to build the infrastructure to start your farm. Uh, you know, there are not your regular bank is not necessarily as willing to, to lend you that to, to start. So most of the young farmers have had to be super creative in figuring out how to do that. There are leasing programs, um, land link, pro, farm link programs that link, you know, landowners with young farmers who would lease that land inexpensively to use. Um, the National Young Farmers Coalition is a great organization. Uh, that you know helps helps to sort of advocate and facilitate a lot of these programs, um, and you know the USDA is definitely offering more more programs, more grants to help young farmers um, get the capital they need. And you know I think it's just really about desire and will. I mean if if this is something you really want to do, most people will find creative ways to do it, and hopefully the more people that do it. It, the more resources will start to become available. And I think they already are. I think it's improving. Thanks, Clara. It was truly a pleasure to have you here today, and we really appreciate you participating. And thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in and sending their questions for this interactive discussion. Uh, once again, this uh, was recorded and will be posted later today on foodtank.com. If you have any follow-up questions, you can email me, sarah at foodtank.com. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day, and thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.